and welcome to everybody on this uh, town hall this morning and this evening. It's always important to me to take stock of why we're together. And so I'm not sure whether you know, but I found out last night that the number of people testing positive for COVID in the world today is 5 million. And that's more than the total population of Ireland. The number of people who have died in the world is almost the entire population of Iceland. And that really helps me put into perspective just the worldwide global impact, but also the personal impact for each and every one of us. With nearly 2 million Twitter followers, 30% of the population and polls that often show more than a 90% approval rating, the 30 year old president from El Salvador has really generated international attention by closing the country down before a single case. You know, almost 30% of the population are Twitter followers of his. But disinformation and misinformation around COVID is a very sneaky and insidious threat to all of us. Almost half of Canadians believe at least one popular coronavirus conspiracy theory or myth, including 26% who believe it's an engineered bioweapon released from a lab, according to a new survey from Carleton University. We seem to get news from all kinds of service sources as well as dubious actors. This town hall is about connecting with and communicating truth in a clear and strategic manner. Our experts today are well known to the IFA and that's why we call them experts, but most of all trusted friends. Peter Evans has worked with breakthrough technologies in sectors as diverse as healthcare, clean tech, digital media and information technology. He co-founded Expert File, a software platform used by, used by leading institutions, including IFA with experts on over 40,000 topics and integrated into 15,000 newsrooms in partnership with the Associated Press. Peter's approach is clean, quick and direct. In 2019, with Expert File firmly entrenched in IFA's armory, Peter said to me, look, Jane, as a friend, I need to tell you that IFA needs an intervention nothing less than an intervention. So that means that I now introduce you to Eli Singer. Eli Singer was the driver behind IFA's brand and informed our strategy, driving the world's population aging. He has been featured in Harvard Business Review and the Globe and Mail and won industry awards, including the Canadian Marketing Association. For over 20 years, He's been an expert in digital marketing and innovation in corporate roles and startups. He founded Intrinsic, a social agency acquired in 2014. Eli is undoubtedly, together with Peter, ahead of the curve in understanding the convulsive and disruptive changes in media and technology. And he's helped, hasn't helped, you know, he's really shown IFA a different way of being and communicating and being seen out there together with Peter Evans. And they're able to distinguish fads from real opportunities in emerging digital landscapes. When the media is, has such a high level of noise around COVID today, we thought it was, would be invaluable for you to listen to Peter and Eli, you know, for their truths around communication, experts, and the channels. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Peter Evans to start off the discussion. Thanks very much, Jane. It's a pleasure to be with you all, uh, all at different times around the world. Uh, I will uh, endeavor to get into a, a quick uh, summary of some of the points that we're gonna talk about today and start us off in the hopes that we can generate a really nice Q&A session later. And Eli will join us, obviously, in a second. Um, what I'm going to cover today is just a little primer on just how the process of news works uh, for good. As you may be well aware, uh, the news business is, is very important 
uh, conduit for um, communications to the public, and it's a key pillar of a civil society. That's a term that Jane uses a lot in her work as an NGO. Uh, we'll talk a bit about how bad things happen with news, fake news, and how that works in some ways, maybe giving you some different dimensions around the dynamics of fake news that are hopefully informative to you. And then, uh, you know, because we're expert file, we actually talk a lot about experts and the role they play. And you often, well, I would think that the majority of you are experts on the call, or you have experts in your organization that can speak to lots of different topics. So I want to point out how rich you may be from a content perspective. You know, we have a bank here, Scotia Bank, that has a, a TV ad, you're richer than you think. Uh, and I say that about content in organizations. A lot of people don't realize the assets they have. And we'll talk about storytelling. And that's something that um, Eli can certainly weigh in on as well. How to stay relevant and how to be noticed and discovered um, in this changing landscape of COVID-19. So just a little bit of background. We launched a COVID-19 search engine in early uh, April, which was focused on your money, your life topics that were critical uh, to get uh, credible, reliable experts out, people that had evidence, uh, that were researchers, that were practitioners, that could provide trusted information to the public by way of news outlets. Uh, and we have since then uh, done a couple of other innovations to bring our free search engine that is used by over 15,000 newsrooms around the world into uh, formats that are far easier now to download. So we have a Chrome extension, and a Microsoft Edge extension that remains on the desktop that allows a journalist to find an expert source at one of your organizations and reach out to them right away uh, with no drama, no Google searches and having to go 10 pages deep. So I wanna talk very briefly about fake news just to get us rolling on that. Um, there are three types of fake news. There is disinformation, which is false, but it's deliberately created uh, to harm a person, a social group, or an organization. And we're also seeing this harming countries where nation states are engaging in disinformation campaigns. The second type of fake news is misinformation. And it's one that we see an awful lot of, and it's actually quite dangerous. And uh, we work a lot with the Associated Press. They do not use the term fake news inside the office. It's a banned term uh, simply because that's a proprietary word that uh, President Trump really popularized. And many news people don't wanna feed into the concept of fake news because it really satisfies an agenda. So that second type of fake news is misinformation. There's no intention of causing harm, but the information is false. And then you've got malinformation, information that's based on reality, but it is used to inflict harm on a person, a social group, an organization or a country. So, um, you know, I think it's important to note that we don't, we have more to worry about with people than we do with bots. And for all of the fuss that's been made about bots and automation and AI, um, it is people that uh, transmit fake news faster. We're more likely to believe peers in our social circles. Uh, we have more to worry about uh, with these people that uh, transmit fake headlines. And the more the fake headlines are repeated, the more we believe them. Um, and we found um, from experiments and research done at Yale University in 2019, uh, that people are more likely to believe news headlines when they're repeated, even if they don't align with that person's uh, political thinking. So the thing I've been fascinated about is not so much the volume of fake news, there's graphs all over the place that you can see about that, I think it's more interesting to go into the types of personas who start and spread viral misinformation. So what we're seeing is uh, about seven personas. You've got your, your typical prankster that is looking for clicks on their YouTube channel. Uh, you've got people that are out for economic gain, the scammers. You've got politicians that are, um, you know, saying that you should treat yourself with disinfectant. I won't name any names on that but that's a third persona. Then you've got your uh, conspiracy theorists, uh, people that are running around saying that 5G towers are actually causing coronavirus. Uh, recently, uh, there's been a lot of theories about a Wuhan lab that this was really hatched by the Chinese. And these are um, you know, dangerous because they're directed at nation states. 
my own sister who does a lot of Facebooking sent me a note on WhatsApp and uh, it just said a few words, Queen Elizabeth has the coronavirus. And I said, did you check, uh, you know, CNN? Have they put it out? Has AP put it out? The answer was no, and they never did. Uh, so another thing that people are, are inclined to do is check in with relatives on social media and those peer groups spread. The next one is a celebrity. Uh, we saw Brian Adams the other day come out uh, talking about the Wuhan wet markets, almost like he had an informed opinion about animal to human transmission. But when you go back to his agenda, he's been a hardcore vegan for many years. And I'm not commenting about that. I think that's a great uh, you know, way of life. I'm uh, trying to get more into a vegan diet, but he's also been a big PETA supporter. So I think you have to always look at the source of the information and look at things like attribution. It's the last one, the seventh type of uh, persona that is the most dangerous, fake experts. They are most dangerous because they provide what appears to be evidence. Uh, when we look at the hydroxychloroquine uh, debacle, as I'll call it, Fox News has been trotting out a whole cadre of doctors, actual MDs, probably board certified if you check them out, but they seem to have a major agenda because they have outlier data, which has not been properly peer reviewed on hydroxychloroquine. And some of these are funded by nefarious organizations and they have an agenda and it just becomes a self, uh, you know, uh, fulfilling prophecy. It's a, it's a bit of an echo chamber that Fox has created around hydroxychloroquine. So this persona, the insider, the fake expert, which has got academic credentials in some cases, and sometimes from Ivy League universities, can do an awful lot of damage when their content is amplified through social channels. So where are we now? Uh, what does this mean for you? Well, the first thing I'd say is that you have to tap into the fact and understand that there's an increasing amount of public distrust. And it means that your sources, the experts that you're putting out there have to be completely credible as much as possible and really well versed in the topics that they're speaking to. We've seen a decline in trust for the first time in 17 years at Edelman, the PR agency, the largest global PR agency, has been tracking trust uh, in different groups like NGOs, government, corporations, and academia. For the first time in 17 years, in all of those sectors, we've seen public trust go below 50%. It's a very disturbing trend. We're seeing an incredible amount of partisanship. People dug in extremely polarized on the left and the right. You've got your liberal elites on the right that are all painted with a broad brush, and then the whole trailer park segment on the other side, and all of the other bad names that people hurl at people. So um, I think the other thing that we've got to be aware of is that the pressure on journalists today, because it is so much of a, a speed game, it's now a supersonic news cycle that was started by cable TV in the first place. But now journalists have to be um, fast. They have to be on deadline. They have to be relevant to build the readership and keep people engaged. But they also have to be accurate. And that's one of the reasons why you with your experts can play a vital role. And it's why we created the COVID-19 search engine. We're seeing a very fast news cycle that means you need to be very proactive and ready to go with your topics. And your experts have to be uh, extremely responsive to not just same day deadlines, but often a journalist will spray, uh, you know, three or four or possibly five different requests of experts asking for commentary and they might only have a slot for one on the evening news or in that newspaper article. If you take your time, you're just not gonna get there. Now, what we find is that many of our clients are upset because they may not have gotten quoted because they had the best person in the world. It's not about that. It's actually in many cases, um, helping the journalist do the job to be done, which is to meet the, uh, the deadline. And it's not about the best person in the world, it's one that will be good enough and often it's one that is often relatable and can actually get the job done for the journalist in educating the public. We don't need the best person in the world with the deepest amount of research, you know, that's in nature and the Lancet. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit today as we open up for questions after Eli's session on how changes in technology and media formats 
are changing how we publish and interact with news uh, with the public and, and with uh, journalists. Uh, but I'll leave you with just a couple of very quick concepts here. Um, there's really five major things you've got to look for in the kind of content, content that you're putting out and when you're putting expert sources into the media. <clears throat> journalists are looking for five tests. And remember, it's a kind of a multi, <clears throat> sorry, it's kind of a multiplicative formula where if you fail on any of these tests, it can mean a total failure to connect with the journalist and get media coverage. You've got to have a relevant topic. So, you know, is it localized in terms of geography? Does it have a unique perspective? Um, uh, are you credible? Is the expert, um, do they have demonstrated biographical information that you can offer? Have they spoken before? Have they appeared in publications or on TV? Are they engaging? Are you using video? Have you created videos for your experts? Uh, you know, you can't sit around and say, we're not getting on broadcast TV. Uh, if you haven't created any videos, you really uh, look like a bit of a risk to a journalist. But things like books, uh, how active are they in social media? How influential are they in social media is a factor on how journalists select an expert source. And one of the most important ones is how responsive are you in terms of helping media, uh, getting back to them and, and helping them uh, get their story filed. So as I close off, I just want to talk about the, a couple of factors <clears throat> that make for a good story that we'll get into in the discussion. And this is the notion of speed. Uh, very, very important that you've got uh, something that is fresh. Something that's a few days old is not interesting to journalists. Speed is a very important factor. Proximity is a very important factor. If it's a story on uh, long-term care in New Zealand, that that Australians and New Zealanders would agree on that, that there are similarities, but the fact that you've got a local expert on the ground is very important to a journalist that's looking to localize the story. How prominent is the expert? How novel is the topic or the data that you've got? Jane talked earlier about just how, you know, she made her data much more interesting and more emotional by saying that the whole population of Iceland, it's equivalent to that population dying instead of just quoting the numbers, framing the data in more relatable terms. So those are a couple of things. I'm gonna go more into that as we talk more about uh, storytelling as we move to Eli's session here. I don't wanna take up uh, more than my time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. So when, by the way, it's a pleasure to meet everybody here, and thank you for inviting me, Jane. I was very, those were very kind words at the introduction. When we were speaking earlier this week, preparing for this, uh, Jane suggested several questions. You know, when fiction takes over the airspace, what do we do? When the most effective way, what are the most effective way to get messages out? With so many messages coming out, how does one curate what's true or, or what to work with in real time? So obviously, these are not simple challenges, and, and certainly not material uh, that you know we can cover in, in deep complexity in, in just about 10 minutes. And, and given that this is an international call, um, these challenges are affected by geography, culture, demographics, uh, regional political climates, and, and an individual's personal situation that they might be dealing with. So there's no one single proven approach to how one can generate success on these issues. So in the 10 minutes that I have, what I want to do is um, focus on seven tips or seven, uh, you know, kind of individual uh, thought starters and ideas and then hopefully plant some seeds that we can go deeper into the question period. Um, so the first is there's an international conversation happening here and one needs to understand the nature of the conversation. Digital conversations produce data, they can be tracked. Everyone's read about tracking on you know, websites like Facebook or through mobile devices. All of that data is available and all of that data can be mapped. There, uh, and they can not just be mapped, but sorted by demographics, by platform, by velocity, by topics, rising topics, trending topics, uh, by hashtags, 
by which links are they trafficking in, so which articles or which material, um, who are the individuals that are the super spreaders, the influencers. And this kind of data is absolutely critical to understanding the true nature of the conversation, understanding what the needs of audiences are, what information people are seeking out, what are the what are the tone of the conversation, positive, negative, neutral, snarky, what have you, hopeful. What are the various different formats and media that are trending? And using this kind of information, it's more it's easier or it's required to help shape the messaging you're going to be using and also find the allies that you're going to need to help spread and share the information that you want to get out there. So some tools that you may want to look into for this kind of data. Uh, one is called Meltwater um, or Sysmos. Another is Google Trends, which you can use, which is a free service. Um, Twitter even has its own search engine uh, at search.twitter.com. Uh, Jane mentioned that I had a social media agency um, that we started early days, and we always use data to define the creative. We called it creative by the numbers. We would go into the data, the data would generate insights, the insights would then generate the strategy and the creative. So that's point one, understand the nature of the conversation. And, and, and to me, that's always the baseline. Number two is earning your rapport and your trust. You can't take for granted the history of the organization or any of the legacy uh, trust that you have. Even traditional institutions like the CDC and traditional formats like film um, are being subverted, right? Film, you've seen that, planned, that pandemic film that was quite well uh, recorded and, uh, in, and put on Vimeo. Everything is being subverted. And so, you know, you have to almost start at the beginning and how do we earn trust? And I would say um, you focus on your people, uh, their knowledge, responsiveness, empathy, and insight. Right, so building on all the things that Peter talked about, um, but starting with the individual because these days it's about people, not necessarily about organizations or institutional trust. And frequency is important, right? Um, the more lines you have in the water, the more opportunity you're going to have to catch fish, and the more rapport you're going to build with people. Point number three: low tech can yield, you know, big opportunities. You know, high fidelity video can certainly move quickly and global scale. And you've seen that with the pandemic and other material, but, but, but high fidelity video can be difficult to produce, especially at speed. Don't avoid low tech and no tech solutions because what they do is they decrease the barrier for participation. They can cut through because channels aren't necessarily very crowded. And low tech and no tech solutions can actually feel very comfortable and personable. So what might be work best for you? Signage. People are, whether the kids are making signage or signage is going up in people's buildings, the, you know, you can look at rainbows on pictures produced by kids with messages put up in buildings as memes. So think about memes in the real world. Think about text messages, right? Um, the very personal nature of being in people's uh, uh, and, and uh, and how those text messages can carry phrases, video, images, and audio. Just make sure you have proper opt-in. And, and even potentially think about faxes and fax machines, uh, especially with more traditional populations, um, and how you can use cool things like graph design to cut through on fax messages, if that's something that could be interest to you, especially certain medical professions where they're used to receiving faxes. Um, number four, multi-generational voices. Okay, so I, over the years, I think this is quite interesting. Um, I've seen some very successful advertisements and communications over the years where adult information is delivered by children and information for children is delivered by adults. And, you know, they take on one another's persona, um, you know, children speaking like they're adults. Adults speaking like their children facing the same kind of challenges children are having. And this kind of unexpectedness um, causes pause in the viewer and reflection. And um, what's interesting about this is it can, when these messages can put the viewer 
in another shoe. I, I'm an adult remembering what it was like when I was a child. I'm a child believing that I can be an adult and in a work setting or in an adult situation. And that yields insights. And it also can create common ground between multi-generational viewers. And I think with some of the challenges that we've talked with over the years with the IFA around really needing to um, bring together the issues of, uh, uh, of aging populations, uh, make their issues relevant among younger populations uh, or just different age demographics. I think this is a really interesting tool. Uh, number five, be careful using emotion. Um, people can be very volatile these days, depending on the situation that they're in personally, whether they're dealing with uh, depression, anxiety, um, or just, you know, on an emotional roller coaster, they could have family that are in challenging situations. And I think, you know, building on some of the fake news elements that Peter talked about, empathy can be faked and concern can feel very phony, um, especially, and, and even if it's legitimate, how it's transmitted and subverted through digital medium can just invert everything. So that said, um, oftentimes being a supportive listener is a very good approach and turning questions and comments uh, that you're putting out there into and the insights that you get from uh, the response to those listening comments, it's almost like a form of digital listening uh, and, and how you can turn those into insights that then can be shared, um, you know, I think is a useful approach. So be careful using emotion and turning that into and turning that to supportive listening and turning that listening into, um, you know, outputs can be helpful. Number six, make sure that you have a diverse team. We always, all of us have our own personal biases and those get worked into the decisions they make, the plans we make, the strategies we develop. So make sure that you have a multi, dem, a, a, a team that's got, you know, multiple ages, multiple demographics, ethnicities, multiple family situations during lockdown. Um, and just make sure that you have that diversity and international diversity as well, where appropriate, much like James curated at this experience here. Um, Next is um, the individual and the collective. Your communications should alternate or vacillate between speaking to an individual, uh, but also then speaking to a collective. Um, building cohesion between, you know, you need that individual communication to build rapport with the person, but then you also need a collective um, to remind people that we are working together with a shared goal, especially during times of isolation, remind them that they have a role, reminding people that there's a collective mission, but their individual responsibilities, um, you know, contribute to that collective and the collective breaks down to individuals. And the last piece here uh, is we want to empower partners with tools. Um, if there are organizations or allies that are better positioned to reach to your uh, to reach uh, the target groups or the organizations that you're trying to reach, empower them with tools. Get that might you know and partner with them. Those tools might be I'm we're going to give you data. We're going to give you raw data. We're going to shape that data into um, graphics. We are going to shape that data into graphics that would or or talking points that would appeal to those groups. And you might even want to go broader, consider giving many people or everyone those data and those tools so they can work with it on their own. Uh, perhaps publish in open formats and invite others to republish and extend the reach of your data. Um, and then potentially use a media spend to amplify uh, what partners are doing. So you might not be able to, you, you might have a limited amount of money to, um, you know, you might find that the data you're producing, if you put media behind it, it won't get a lot of traction. But if that content has been repurposed, re-engineered by a third party that might have a great reach or reach among a very specific audience you're looking to, put your media dollars behind that 
and see if you get, if you get more effectiveness that way and look at the data. So those are my, my points. Uh, hopefully those will be some great starters. And uh, I guess, Jane, I'll turn things back to you for the Q&A card. Look, thanks Eli, and also thanks to Peter. I guess one of the things that I talked with you about earlier this week was, um, you know, we, we really want this to be a global conversation. So those that are living in low and middle income countries, you know, how do they take messages and communicate them? And uh, both of you had some, you know, ideas about that because, you know, one of them that you mentioned was um, around low tech, no tech. So could you just comment on, you know, how do we support and help build the capacity of others uh, in low and middle income countries? I mean, uh, sure. I think that every, you know, situations are unique, right? Because in low tech, no tech environments, you really have to understand, okay, how is information moving around? Is it through uh, word of mouth? Is it through traditional signage? Is it through um, creating, uh, you, you know, installations or experiences in public space that, you know, you know, whether it's a signage or statues or, you know, street street art in public space that can be photographed and turned into news stories and cycled around. So I think you got to think creatively about that. But then also think of what, you know, and you can look at the digital data to get this insight, or you can do it through uh, communicating with people. But what are the phrases and the words that people are sharing, and see what kind of information you can create that will work in a, in a word of mouth situation. Um, you know, but even, uh, you know, traditional things like print signage, um, text messages, images and text messages, short form video and text messages. Uh, as long as people have access to data on their phone, the cost of distribution of this can be close to free and can have very, very wide, uh, wide reach. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask Greta Garnas and then Francis Zanadin to uh, ask questions. Uh, Greta, are you with us? Uh, yes, Jane, you sort of was on the thought that I was thinking. Um, it's good that we do have to remember the low tech because many countries, including in the States, are having problems with people getting access to the internet. So thinking old school is not necessarily a bad idea. It's not necessarily a question I have, but maybe a thought. Um, you know, traveling around the States and traveling around Europe, there have been many mural projects, uh, young and old, big and small, and, you know, maybe, you know, let the artists and people run wild and put murals up on the sides of buildings and billboards. I mean, it, it engages a lot of people, it gets the message out. Uh, maybe that's the, the best way, a, a good way to reach a, a number of people that maybe don't have modern technology. Okay, so I guess, my look, I think that's a great point. My, my question is going to go back to Peter. Peter, you've, you've gathered 40,000 plus experts from around the world, right? I guess my question is, do we have artists in your group of experts? And is that another population we need to start reaching out to? Because we talk about across disciplines and across um, sectors. So perhaps you could respond to that. I think there's so many better ways to find artists than expert file. I'm going to disqualify myself there because we're typically going to have art historians and academics that, you know, are in higher education settings. Uh, so the kind of grassroots, you know, community swell you're looking to do with say a murals project is going to be highly localized. And the chances that that person sitting at a university, that would be a mismatch. I think it's more grassroots. I think that, the, you would want to go uh, into social media and see who's being followed. Also, what artists, you know, have some degree of influence. That's also good to piggyback on the follower uh, and, and, you know, all of the stuff that they're doing. Are they putting stuff on YouTube or TikTok or uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram being probably one of the most popular visual platforms. But I love that idea of the mural project because it, it really is in many ways tapping into a story uh, which, you know, the backstory of how it actually happened. It's not enough to just put the uh, murals out there. I think it, people want to know, how did this happen? So what made a story that Chris Cuomo told last night on CNN much more impactful 
was the fact not that there was 1,500 uh, art kits given out to kids in homeless shelters, but it was, I believe, don't quote me on this, I think she was like eight years old. And it was a girl that I think around Christmas time wanted to do this and asked for her um, Christmas gift from her parents to be some funds to start putting these kits together. They got their first 40 done and now they're putting thousands of these out into homeless yeah. shelters. So in many ways, the backstory is the most interesting part of that for the journalists because they are yeah. gifted storytellers. Yeah. So just a, a little bit on that. Okay. I think Greta's um, just suggested that we have a big Banksy movement. So anybody that knows Banksy, you know, just uh, send, their phone, uh, send their email. Um, I, would, I would just jump into that to add, yeah. you know, having done a lot of work in the, uh, in the arts and culture sector, um, I, in many regions, like, art, there, are, there are art communities, there are local art communities that can be easily found online, collectives, groups, self-organizing groups, um, street art, uh, musicians, and I would suggest like simple online searches, regionally focused, should be able to track those groups down. And, okay. and uh, smart, smart idea. So I'm going to ask Anita Kells. Are you on the line, Anita? Yes, you are. We'll hold on to you. Turn your mic on, Anita. Oh, there she is. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. And welcome. You're from Finland, I, I, I remember. Yes, I am. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for giving me the word. Uh, I was just wondering when you were explaining uh, about uh, different kind of um, uh, fake inf information uh, that if, if you could explain a little bit of what are the kind of um, uh, misinformation or how did you go? Disinformation, misinformation or malinformation about uh, old people because uh, I am very worried about the erroneous views and age stereotypes that we have also in Finland and in the Nordic countries, especially related to the uh, old care homes where we know that half of the those uh, who died in Europe were are actually coming either from these homes or, or, or from home care. And I think this is very important to tackle because uh, when we think of the future strategies and policies that we need to put in place, we need to understand that these people are not, like many believe, on their last legs and they would have died anyway in a very short, short time. So this is one of my concerns, but if there are any other very serious things that we should especially target. I would be. I would appreciate that. Thank you, Anita. We'll wait. Um, thank you for your question. I, I'll I'll let the gentleman sort of hold that and ask uh, you three a Sutton Baldoyle. Um, would you like to just share your comment because I think it it really backs up what Anita was saying. Are you there? All right. Um, if you're you know, please put your mic on, mic on if you can. But uh, uh, the comment was, there's a lot of institutional ageism, benevolent patronage and image, images and language. Um, and this is really coming through in a number of different ways. So could I ask both of you to comment on how do we as advocates really challenge that and change the narrative? The first thing that occurs to me, if I could jump in on that is, are you pooling information around the myths? Uh, you know, similar to the way that CNN has hired a fact checker that is actually, I forget his name, but he's from Toronto and relocated mm -hmm. to Washington. And CNN's now keeping a running database of, of Trump uh, myths. And, you know, that plays well uh, in terms of it being newsworthy. But is there an international myth busting database that could be formed uh, through a coalition and then localize it so that we understand what's happening on the ground in Finland or New Zealand or, or anywhere else uh, and bring that together as an open source uh, database. It would be very, very helpful, you know, statistics and, uh, but we want to speak to images of uh, resilience, not just vulnerability, right? Uh, and stories like our, our friend Commander Tom, who's now going to be made a knight, um, you know, and 
long live this guy. He's over 100, the guy that just did 100 laps around his backyard to raise money for the NHS. Um, those stories are great, but you have a very important moment here right now where you've got to dispel the myths. But if you're not cataloging these and then making them available to journalists, for instance, that would be an amazing thing that you could own. CNN shouldn't be owning that. It should be the IFA or um, you know affiliated organizations. I would, I would just jump into that as well. I think there is a real opportunity to make this quite personal and local and visual. You know, these these in these numbers of people, these kind of age groups, they have faces, they have stories, they have lives, and they were they were kids and once and they were parents and aunts and uncles. And it is through multi-generational visual storytelling, I think there's ways to bring that to life. And I think there could, whether it's working with artists, uh, graph designers, photographers, video storytellers, um, or family members, I think that there are probably many ways to experiment in, in uh, storytelling, to build connections, to make those people's lives um, meaningful to people of different generations and people in government and make the choices to cut care much more difficult and costly for politicians. And I think it's possible to play with those kinds of, with, with an array of those kinds of images through many different artists and storytellers. And then as one sees certain, as one sees them start to take traction, focus on the mediums or the types of stories or the messages that are getting traction and then amplify those. And one might find that in different geographies and different cultures um, or in different pol political situations, uh, different types of mediums and messages are taking hold. So that might be a takeaway uh, here for this group to maybe centrally the IFA or group could define uh, five, six, 10 different archetypes of low cost, um, different format types of storytelling, which the groups could collaborate on creating collectively and putting out regionally and globally, seeing which ones take hold and then driving scale behind those. Uh, that might be a local and international effort that could be coordinated by the IFA. Great, great idea, Eli. I just want to acknowledge Jane Teasdale. Um, she talked about the Mosaic Home Care Services reaching out to the theatre and acting performance graduates of Humber College. So they're doing some stuff. Also, Sylvia Peril Levin from Geneva. She's put a resource in the chat box. And I'm going to ask uh, Lorraine Leclerc and then uh, Bruce West. So Lorraine and then Bruce. Lorraine, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Um, thank you for this opportunity to ask the question. I'm just curious about your feelings uh, with regards to using testimonials. Uh, I understand that in this particular environment, it could be a little bit delicate, but I also think that there's a stronger message when it comes from the provider and also the receiver with regards to some of the messaging that we're dealing with today. Overall, I think the testimonials work. I think they're real, they have value, um, they have the right emotion, they have everything that can kind of give that bang flavor when you're dealing with, um, you know, handing out that message out to the general public. So I'm just interested to see what your feelings are on that. Thank you. And then I'll just take another, another question. Uh, Bruce, did you want to make a comment? Just a quick comment. I, it struck me that <clears throat> it's a challenge right now um, bringing forth the stories of people in long-term care facilities, especially um, given that those facilities are shut down, they're closed in. We, we can't go in and see what those people are experiencing. So um, perhaps as the, uh, as the pandemic eases off, this is something that uh, uh, we, could, uh, we could concentrate on going into facilities. Uh, get a better perspective on the people who were there and how they're living, both from a positive and from uh, and from a negative perspective. Okay, so Eli, hi, welcome. 
Faith and love, Sal. Hi. Hi, how are you going? Good morning. It's a bit early for you, buddy. These people are all over the world. Yeah, good Good to see you. So, um, Peter and Eli, any comments about uh, Bruce and also a question from Lorraine? I, I, I'll just jump in on Bruce's comment, just the most contemporary one that made that he made. Um, I think in, in many ways you, you have to prepare for this because now they're about to start opening up and uh, you, I, there is a first mover advantage uh, because journalists are going to want access to those facilities. Um, you must be thinking about B-roll and you know background videos and things like that and, and being able to provide those assets to journalists and newsrooms. So, and I also saw this note here about, you know, um, uh, that Greta put out about you know, a home care facility that she's working with in Southern Maine, they're doing everything right, but they're not getting any press for that because it's not negative. I get that, but I, I actually think that you've got to frame the information as a story about um, a good news story. Um, again, you just can't say, hey, we're following all the procedures. It doesn't become newsworthy or interesting. It's not relatable enough to the audience. I think one of the big things that has to be looked at here is I find the whole long-term care uh, issue quite complex. We have a systemic issue. Um, and I think you've got to break it down into things like infographics and visual data and showing even the processes and, and, and really articulating in a very visual way where, what processes are broken. So it's not just owning uh, sort of a database of myths, but can you actually explain more intelligently to the public through the lens, through media to get to government policymakers to make them understand where the breakpoints are in the process. There is going to be a search for answers as to what has failed us in many countries. 80% of the deaths, I believe, for COVID in Canada have been in long-term care, if I'm not mistaken on that, Jane. Um, there will be an inquiry and you want to be at the table with as much visually, um, you know, intuitive data as possible. Just a thought on that. Okay. Eli, any comments? Yeah, I'll just comment on the first question or first okay. uh, note about testimonials. And obviously, I think, um, you know, those kinds of personal stories are highly valuable. I, I just want to, I think they're part of a portfolio of communications, because testimonials, there's always going to be someone with a point of view on the other side. Um, and so how are you going to generate a custom a testimonial that's going to be relevant, that's going to cut through, uh, that's going to be meaningful for people, um, you know, that's going to be either multi-generational and effective through that nature or advisory to someone in a similar situation. But I mean, in a world where everyone can record a video selfie and put a picture out there and you can't even validate if what they're saying is true. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a, um, you know, you, you you just can't rely on a testimonial to carry the weight that it might have 10, 15 years ago through traditional media. Okay, look, thank you. As we're coming 10 to the hour, I'm just going to ask the two experts, Eli and Peter, just to have their takeaway messages ready. But I'm going to call on uh, Sylvia Peril Levin and also Jane Tisdale. So Sylvia and then Jane. Thank you, Jane, and thank you for very... Again, very interesting town hall. I, just a comment. I mean, I work many years on community theater, working with all generations. And I have also worked with uh, what I call the entertainment industries. Sometimes when we talk about the media, we only focus on the news when the entertainment industry is, um, is a very good channel to bring up stories. And I'm very happy that you, everybody mentioned storytelling. But it's not just about working with the big ones, but also the knowledge that the, 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 the dramas that are coming through on Netflix, for example, are not only coming from the US, they are also coming from productions around the world that become universal. So, and also without even having to go to Netflix, to learn as well very, very excellent local, low, Coast productions that are being done like in Argentina or puppet uh, stories in, in India, things that we can also learn from what goes on in other places of the world and not only looking what we can take from the big ones. Thank you. 
Yeah, and I think, Sylvia, what you're really telling us, and I agree, that local situations are so unique. Um, and even in a city, you know, within city, the local situations are telling us something. Um, and so I thank you for that. Um, I do want to give Jane Teasdale the floor. Jane? Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, so I'm one of the owners of Mosaic Home Care, and we just actually start, you know, just started actually three weeks ago with um, about five actors from Humber College. Um, so at the moment, this is just right at the start. They're having to do research right now to understand what is happening on the landscape. Um, and they're going to be doing some small vignette uh, videos. Um, and this is for members that have uh, come to Mosaic for the socialization prior to COVID. But also I think they're wanting to reach out to other community organizations. Um, this is a group that is quite tight together. They've just graduated. So um, it's a work in progress. I think the, um, they're going to be doing their first little show for um, Alzheimer's Society York Region. Um, and we run a First Link Memory Cafe. So we're going to see what that's like, and uh, you know, later on, I can let everybody know once they once they become familiar. I think with doing the research of what's happening. Look, so thank, thank you. Thank, thanks, Jane, and thanks um, for all of the people as part of Mosaic that are on the front lines. Thank in, you very in our, much. In our great country. Appreciate um, that. That sounds like Mr. Trump in our country. All right. <laughs> um, I just want to acknowledge uh, Rebecca Lines. Uh, Rebecca, you talked about what's going on in Greater Manchester. So did you want to just speak to that for a minute and then I'll go back to Eli and Peter to wrap up. Uh, yeah, um, I just wanted to say that in, in Greater Manchester, we have been working um, to promote the normal, the normal stories as well as kind of speaking to some of these extraordinary things that are coming out in the national press. We think it's really important to get those images, videos, um, any ideas that are coming from older people about just getting on with it. Um, we had previously sent um, a letter, an open letter to the press calling out ageism, but we think that actually putting forward these positive um, and real stories is a really, really good way of combating that. Uh, look, thank you. Um, and uh, Chesley's on, on the line, our uh, comms manager. So we'll pick that up. Um, last question goes to one of my staff. So whoever put, um, what are the recommendations? So who's game enough to put their hand up? Mr. Shaw, really? Yes. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so I'm really interested to hear from Eli and, and um, um, really how do we actually get noticed? How do we get journalists to pick up stories or how do we contribute to news cycles which are current where we as organisations, whether it's the IFA or any of you on this call, have input that you think can contribute to the news cycle so that you become relevant to the media? How do, what's the best way to reach journalists to comment on stories? Okay, so in your responses, can you also give us your closing message because we've just got a couple of minutes to go. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. So, Peter, why don't you go first, since that is your... Yeah, I, if there's one silver bullet you've got, it's data. And it, it's aggregating data glo globally, but at a local level, making it visual. Uh, journalists will eat that up. They're looking for stuff that's original and it's timely. It, it demonstrates impact. It's relatable. You're doing work for the journalists. That's the fastest way to get noticed. You always have to add value. You can't just expect that opinion is going to trade as well as evidence. And that is your, uh, that's your destiny. I think everybody on the phone is in that, they already have that nailed and you just have to be there and get the timing right. It's a speed game and you've got to bring that stuff to the party. Okay, thanks, Peter. Eli? Sure, one of the, one of the items that uh, Peter and I discussed last night, uh, but, didn't seem to make it into this conversation. So I'll bring it up as my closing argument or position is around your own organizational positioning. I think it's really critical that you take the time to plan to really get sharp, very pointed with what is your 
primary key message? What are you going to stand for during this era? And what is that, how does that, um, that core positioning get uh, reflected in all of your communications and your messaging going out so that you can be, you know, whenever you're making contact with the public, that it comes back to this is the one thing that this group stands for. And that positioning not just needs to resonate to your audiences in terms of the public, but your funders, the donors, the, uh, the regional government, all those other stakeholders that are going to help an organization get through and survive and thrive during this era. Really. Okay, look, thank you. In wrapping up, I want to acknowledge the IFA staff, particularly Chesley and Andra, um, our experts and our friends, Peter Evans and Eli Singer. Uh, and I just want to touch on some of the words that really jumped out to me. These days, it's about people. More lines in the water, better choice of fish. Low tech, no tech. Multi-generational, relatable. A portfolio of communications. Data is our destiny. This is a speed game. Normal is the extraordinary. Getting on to it. I think the final piece for me is what do you and I and we stand for? Not only in COVID, post-COVID, but what are we going to stand up and fight for? with and on behalf of older people. So I want to thank you all for being with us today. Um, thank the IFA staff and people from all around the world and most particularly Eli, Peter and Silas. So enjoy the day, have a good sleep those in Australia and New Zealand and we'll see you next week where we hear from Grace Chan, Director of Innovation and Technology in Hong Kong talking about COVID older people and how does technology and innovation enable older people to do what they value within the context. So thanks everybody. See you next week.